What's up, guys? All right, welcome to episode one of the Feeble Minded Podcast. So this is basically a continuation of what I've been doing on YouTube, which is just treating it as an introspective journey. You know, so just trying to be 100% myself, like as much as I can, not lying or faking anything in videos and just really trying to be completely honest and then using, you know, the challenges I'm faced with as just like, like weeding them out, you know, and just continuing to hopefully go in a better direction, just learning more about myself. Um, one of the things that I quickly learned from doing YouTube was like, I don't know, all the insecurities everyone has is talk, like hearing your own voice is a huge one. Second is, what else? Looking at yourself, like hearing your own ideas and stuff like that. And it's incredibly uncomfortable for most people, but I think if you push through that, there's just such like a, it's such a rich place for information and for learning about yourself. It's because I, I think everyone thinks that they're the only one that has that problem, you know, that they can't get over that awkwardness of hearing their own voice. I think it's just a part of being a human being though. And once you push past it, you start to realize your insecurities or how you're overthinking or just things of that nature. I mean, that's what happened for me. And it just seems like it could be applied to everyone. You know, it's not just like an individual thing. It's, you know, if you feel that way, when like you have a passionate idea or something you want to pursue and... You always just put it off because like, oh, I'm not the guy and the guy that is in front of the camera or this or that. I was that guy. Like before this, I had no social media at all. No cell phone. Completely pretty much off the grid. No credit cards. Like nothing at all. And, you know, I had to learn all these things from scratch, right? And I was just facing that, that awkwardness of, I hate the camera, you know, ego, cheesy, sell out, like all that type of stuff was my enemy. And it turns out that that was actually my best friend. Like that was where everything I needed to learn was and everywhere I wanted to be was hidden behind this like mask, you know? And a lot of the times I think the fears that we create are where the answers lie like that's where we should be but we create like like you're creating a jealousy for someone or maybe you're hating an action someone does that might be where you want to be right so it just gives you an easy thing you pinpoint it you hate them oh, i hate what they're doing that's whack blah 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 but really that's where you want to be you know, so you're kind of putting that on someone else and then distracting yourself from it without having to face your own fears. Well, I mean, that's exactly what I did, I realized. When I was younger, a younger skateboarder, I was trying to get on a team called S, right? And I was on the flow team, but I had an opportunity to go meet up with the guys, the real team doing a demo, like upstate New York, so... I had a friend of mine drive me all the way up there and, you know, he like takes time out of his life to come with me. You know, he wants to see me succeed and we get there. I'm like super nervous and they start doing the demo and I'm still not out there with them doing it. I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, I don't want to get in these guys way. Like, I don't want to be that kid that just jumps in the session, like trying to make it like so hard. Like no one, you know, I don't know, just that never gave me a good feeling doing things like that. But, you know, so I ended up not even skating that whole day. We drove up there and I just didn't even skate. Right. Later on down the road, I realized that that was me. That was me creating my own fears, like a fear of six or a fear of failure rather. And yeah, and I think that's underneath a lot of the things that people do. It's like 
to fear of failure or where you want to be. So you create stories that fill in and like fix you not doing the thing you want to be doing. So, I mean, this took me a long, long time to learn. Just really examining things, getting older, I guess, having more perspective. And then, um, I don't know, like looking at friends that hate filming, for example. They hate filming skateboarding. Like, they hate being interviewed, let's say. We'll use that as an example. They think that's egotistical or they're, they're embarrassed of themselves or talking about themselves they hate. But these same people would be filming full-length video parts or posting on Instagram constantly. And it's just like, it doesn't add up. It just doesn't make sense. You do like the attention. Like, you're you're putting in so much effort to put this thing together to show off to people. You know, that's what you're doing, really. You're skating, you're just kind of like showing off the whole time. So, I mean, you could do it. You're doing it for yourself, but I think there is some sort of an underlying element of like, look, look what I did or look what we progressed at as a whole or, you know, there's something involved in the community with that, but I think it's like not acknowledged. And, you know, I I used to do the same thing. I was just so embarrassed of. It also could be just a New York thing. You know, I've traveled around the country to every state in America, and some of these ideas don't even exist there. You know, like sometimes it takes a really complex, intricate city with all sorts of diversities and ideas to like make this problem happen. And you know, in New York, it's a huge thing to like not be a sellout or not be egotistical or cheesy or all these things. And I don't know. I think I don't want to say it's completely useless of an idea. Cause I think that pushes people forward. Like it can make really good styles. And that's probably part of the reason why New York skateboarding is like one of the top, you know, top skateboarders in the world live in New York because of that pressure, you know? So it's, Ideally, you like want to get rid of stuff like that, but you have to realize there's also a balance and that push could create like that negative push almost creates that like positive and amazing eliteness of a certain aspect. But I don't know, back to YouTube and pursuing that. I was just one day I had a moment where it just hit me. I was like, all these things. I'm like, I've just been bullshitting myself all these years. Like, it's just been a lie. You know, making up excuses. And I don't even think people really notice. Like, no one notices or can tell. But, you know, after you realize all these things, you're like, wait, I'm kind of like not doing what I truly want to do. You know, and that doesn't even come out right off the bat either. So... For me, it was, I had no money, like no resources, nothing at all, no skills. And I just went to the store and leased an iPhone 7 Plus, right? With money I didn't even have, basically. And you could get one for like 30 something a month. Maybe you have to pay up front for it. Maybe you don't. I don't even know. But got the phone and just started making videos. Just, I was like, what, what could I do? Like, what could I do that's honest? And I quickly realized I just love teaching. Like I taught skate camps before and I always love sharing information and I don't know, I was trying to help people and I was skating for like 18, 15 years, something like that at this point. So it's like, all right, well you have all this information. You can share it with people. Right. So that's what I did. I just started doing trick tips and just trying, literally just trying to help and learning how to edit in the process. And going through that and hitting all these speed bumps, it's like, I don't know. That's how you weed out all your weaknesses in my eyes. You know, you're like, 
you just keep pushing forward. Like learning how to edit was just grueling. Just trying to find music to put in the videos when you don't know anything. Like you don't know what songs you could use that you have permission to use. You don't know how to download them onto your phone. Like through an, like weird apps. Like everything is just extremely long and, and grueling and spaced out. Like the learning curve in the beginning. And I feel like it's like that with everything. You know, if, if you can do it in one aspect of your life, you can do it all over. So I just kind of thought about it the same way as skating. It's like you're not good in the beginning. It takes like a year or two to start learning tricks and really get good. And yeah, I just put my head down and... Obviously, it's embarrassing, like, you're putting out this awkward video, but who cares, you know? As long as you're focused on what you're doing, and if you have your reason, it doesn't matter, you know? So I had my reason, and it was all this stuff I was doing in the past wasn't really true. Like, I wanted to make a living off of skating or something creative my whole life. Like, that was my main focus in life but from growing up in New York or the situations that were around me or the people it that like it it made it that I shouldn't attempt to do that you know because I'd be badgered for it or like looked at like a sellout or something so I was at this really weird point where the, like the ideas didn't make sense you know and I wasn't even paying attention I was just coasting forward and nothing was happening. And then once I had the realization, just kept kept pushing forward. And it was just, it was so brutal. And, you know, back to that looking at yourself in the camera thing. It's like every day you'll just look and be like, what am I even saying? What am I doing? Like, is this, what's the point? You know, and that is the hardest part to push through. It really is. It's like, just, yeah, it's almost too hard to word sometimes or even bring myself back to that place. But yeah, that's, that's been the path that I've taken on YouTube and how I've thought about it. And same thing with all my challenges. Like I did um, a new trick in every state in America for 50 days in a row. And that was a version of the same thing. It's just like, it'll weed out all my weaknesses, get me better at things. You know, it's just a vacuum of information and you just like force yourself to go through it and hopefully come out the other end, just with all the useless parts of your life, like shed off of you, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been an interesting journey, I would say, just because I knew that this was my goal in life since I was like 15 years old. Like I dropped out of school. I was, this is what I wanted. So it's just crazy to think back and be like, I wasn't really pursuing it like with focus and like trying to make it happen. I was just blindly skateboarding and yeah, I was progressing in skateboarding, but I guess it was partially due to that. I didn't even care about money or ideas like at all, at all. I thought items and things were just empty. And so I wasn't trying to sculpt my skating into something that like reaped me money, you know, or benefits also. So it's kind of a whirlwind of all these things. But it's funny. You could think you're just wrong forever. People could tell you doing the wrong thing. Or like, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? You know, 10, 15 years of just failing. Not being successful. Not having money. Start getting older. Girlfriends break up with you. People look at you differently in society. And just fighting through that. Like. I just didn't care. I was going that way no matter what. And I wasn't being stopped by the opinions of others, right? And that's 
I'm lucky for that. Definitely that I had that ability to just push forward because now it's starting to make sense. Like 15 years later, 16, 17, 18 years later, it's like, I'm almost in a better spot than some of the people that went to school. You know, they're all in debt, um, doing things they might not be liking to do, following the dreams and words of others. They got some money, but a lot of the people I've talked to that I even went to school with aren't happy or they're not, you know, psyched them where they're at. And, you know, it's like a weight of like putting off honesty. Like, you put off honesty, and it's going to come back around. You know, and, like, 10 years later, if you didn't, like, follow what you truly wanted to, you're going to get hit with a weight, most likely. I think that's, like, the essence of a midlife crisis, you know? But I ended up following it, and then, you you know, I turn 30, and, like, so I don't have any of these attachments, no houses, no jobs, no debt, like nothing like that. It's almost like a blank slate. So it's kind of cool to see like now I'm actually at a good spot, right? Where I might be able to make this work. So you never know, you know, sometimes it can feel like you're in the wrong place and everyone's telling you that for years and years and years. And then one day it could just kind of flip flop. Society changes a little bit. You change, and then you're like, you know, doing okay in the eyes of others, which shouldn't matter either way. It shouldn't matter the good or the bad. Like, that's the most important lesson, I think, in life. It's just like, if you give up caring about the bad things and the good things, you're good. It's just... You got to focus on the task at hand. That's what I'm starting to learn. It's just all those things are just noise. And if you're in the present moment, focusing on what you're doing, that's all that matters, right? So that's by your own rule book. Like if you're making good decisions in your eyes and you're moving forward, that's it. I mean, and that line can get weird to walk because what? You're like... You get fearful, like you'll just be like, all right, I'm doing what I'm doing. But then what if you become so blind that you start being messed up towards people or oblivious or ignorant or something like that, you know? Like where do you walk that line? That's something I would get stuck on and still do. So still trying to navigate it, but it's been really cool forcing myself into these just incredibly awkward scenarios for myself and seeing what comes out of them. Um, being a skateboarder in my thirties, like 32, I think it's part of like the wiring in my head. I don't know if it's from being around skateboarders my whole life and they just don't really care about age. Like skateboarders will skate with people all different ages. Like it doesn't matter races, anything, sexes, doesn't matter. Um, it's funny. Like when I started, when I was skating, I used to bring out my cousin and he was like 10 years old and he'd come out and skate with like 30 year olds and we'd go on trips to Philly. So it's just very diverse. So maybe I just didn't think about age as much as the normal person might, but no, I get asked a lot, is it weird being a skater in your 30s? And I don't know. It's kind of always, I don't know if I block it out or I just don't even think about it. But to me, it's I'm doing what I love to do and that's it. And that's the most important thing you could do in life, really. Like I'm just trying to produce something original that pushes my limits and maybe can help other people. Like if that's not what, that's what I think like life is mainly about doing, you know, and I play a little bit of guitar and I would think about covering songs, you know, like it's awesome to share 
a beautiful song that was already made with somebody else, right? And people love covers. That's cool. But in my head, I was just always thinking, I got to write my own songs. Like, Why am I going to learn other people's songs? That's their life, their emotions, their whole thing, you know? And yeah, I get it. You play a song here or there or two, cover, that's fine. But don't make it the main focus, you know? People have so much to give and such original experiences that can be applied to everyone. It's like, I think if you push through all those awkward, difficult situations, you write a song or something like that, you know, you push through and that's how you help. You share. That's that's the definition of art, I think. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Who even knows that word's got a little uh, something stank on it, but... To me, that's that's what I love to pursue, and that's like almost the ultimate meaning that guides my life. You know, I never really even articulated that, but that's definitely, I think, what drives me. You know, and that's it keeps me going in that direction. The um, it's funny though to see other people just I don't know. You can kind of see it in their eyes, just almost sometimes laughing and they can't even believe what I'm doing and they think I'm just insanely irresponsible. But it's funny because in my head, I'm just going down a really slow path. It's going to take a long time to make a living off of what I love to do. Might take forever, you know? So that's fine. I'll just Keep trucking along, but I'll feel great at the end of every single day. Like, that's the most important takeaway is like, may not have the most money or whatever it is that you care about, fill in the blank, but I feel good at the end of every single day. And that's it. I'm going to keep following that, that guideline. Um, yeah, you could see the look in people's eyes for sure. It's like, it's like a slight judgment, judgmental look or a little, you know, little giggle or something. Maybe they'll just make a passive joke, you know, that about how they can't believe I'm doing it or trying this. But I don't know. It's been, I almost have enjoyed shocking people, you know? Just doing shocking things. Like that makes me laugh internally. Like infinitely laugh. Just doing something that someone almost can't grasp. And that is definitely an underlying factor in my life as well. You know, like the 50 tricks and 50 states challenge, new trick every day. Like I like doing shocking new things and pushing the envelope, you know. So it's been cool hitting a point where all the aspects of my life are like integrating. And I don't think it would have happened unless I went down this path of learning about myself, you know? So it's cool. Um, it's fine. Another thing about skating when you're older is like you really got to focus on taking care of your body. It's like, I mean, you can't take the same slams. I took a couple of years off and came back and jumping downstairs, just that meat hitting into the ground over and over and over is like, you don't heal as fast. Even just trying tricks on a mini ramp, like even just smashing my foot onto the coping over and over, I'm just getting sore a lot quicker and I'm even eating healthier, but your body really isn't working. So. That's another thing I'm really trying to focus on. Like I quit, you know, focusing on my diet. I went on a ketogenic diet. And that's basically just to keep me in control, mainly eating just meat and greens, keeping everything light. And it really helped with focus, you know. It really helped with focus and... Yeah, I would just get lazy eating bread and things like that. So, 
went on that diet. And that I think that's when I actually came up with the idea for the new trick every day challenge. I was like, I think it just cleared up things in my head like a grogginess, you know, and it really just made me focus. And I also came up with the new trick in every state in America while I was on the ketogenic diet. So to me, there's no question that it helps. It's just, is it sustainable? You know, does it give me good, like a solid amount of energy to skate? Because I'll skate and try a trick for like three, four hours straight. So like I'm not a health, you know, I don't know much about health at all or diet, but you could get drained pretty quickly, I imagine. Not eating certain things, so. I would definitely check, you know, I'm not recommending that diet to everyone, but for me, it like cleared up a lot of grogginess and gave me more energy and focus. Um, But overall, just eating healthier, something you got to pay attention to as you get older. Um, I quit drinking. You know, that was a huge one. Just the amount of focus you gain from not having that influence in your life. First, there's just the way it affects your body and your mind. You get rid of it and you're a different person in like two, three months, right? Then there's the aspect of once you quit alcohol, you stop hanging out with those types of people generally, you know, and it starts to weed out a lot of bullshit, weed out empty friends or friends that just wanted to escape their lives and just need someone to do it with, you know? Um, You stop going out. You save all that time. All that time starts to get funneled back into your life, right? It's just scattered in all these, like, six-hour, eight-hour sessions of just standing at a bar, talking about nothing, doing nothing productive. It's, like, empty, You take it away and it's awkward. I think people are scared of taking it away. Right? And it makes sense. But you take it away and then you're bored. You know, you feel weird. You feel awkward. And then what happens? You know, it slowly starts to creep into your life. Oh, well, I got nothing to do. Well, well, let me me try to figure out what I like to do. Oh, I'll go to a show. Oh, I don't. Interesting. I don't like going to music shows anymore or a festival. You know, you realize you just used, you know, I used to pour alcohol on everything. And that's what made it fun. You take out the alcohol, you're like, wait, I don't like baseball. Like, I never watched sports ever. Like, we just used to come here and drink, you know, or like a lot of musicians, there's just, yeah, something to do and go drink and party with your friends. And then it starts to focus in on yourself, or for me it did, and what I love to do, and that's when you start to take your life back, and really start paying attention. Wait, oh, actually, I used to love skating all the time. I'm going to start doing that again. Like, what was I doing? This empty, just going out, you know? So that aspect of giving up. Alcohol is huge. Um, it's basically how I look at all all the things, like even weed. You know, I don't have anything against weed, but if you do it a lot, it's got the same effect as alcohol, you know? Um, it's interesting. <laughs> like no one, I mean, alcohol for sure, hands down, gets in the way of people's lives. And I was one of them. And I would just be like, I don't know. I was so good at being a drunk. Like I could still go to work. I could, you know, I didn't skate as much, but it's easy to lie to yourself. You know, I was playing guitar and writing songs. So I thought I was still being productive, but it just leaves a negative connotation on your life that, if you take it away and deal with the awkwardness or the less funness of, you know, that disappearing, you'll be thankful, I think. I mean, what do I know? But I always compare it to you go out drinking, you'll have a night, 
That's amazing. You skyrocket up and then you crash down the next day and you don't feel good. And quitting, you're just kind of in the middle and maybe you're steadily rising up, you know, or you're like, like this. I think, I mean, you got to experience what you got to experience. You know, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now, which I feel is a really good spot unless I went as hard as I did when I was younger. So I'm not really endorsing it, but that's where, you know, it's almost like you need to suffer enough to know what not to be, you know, what direction to not go into. And I wouldn't change until I hit this point. It's like you hit this point and you can finally snap out of it. No one could tell you, me anything ever. And that's it. You just have to hit a certain point where you could snap out of it and then move in another direction. Um, but yeah, being able to apply this to every aspect of my life. It's like. You realize. I'm almost realizing karma doesn't exist in a sense like you're just doing things and the results are happening it's very clear and sometimes we keep them like groggy but it's just very simple like all the things I was getting or not getting were from me not putting in the work like I didn't make it in skateboarding because of those ideas and it's easy to blame it on the industry or the people or you didn't have a filmer or no one was around. But you can pretty much always go out, and go get it and move forward and start going towards something. And I wasn't. And a lot of times people don't. And as you move down this path of like honesty and letting go of things. You begin to see it's just pretty plain and simple. You just you do a good thing and good things happen. You move forward. It's not like a magical going around like, oh, I did something nice for this person. So in six years, I'm going to win the lottery. It's like that type of karma doesn't exist. It's more of like. I mean, there's going to be incredibly tough to sum up karma in a sentence, so. Probably shouldn't even try to do it, but I'll think about it like if you're overall doing good actions, the re those things are going to keep trickling back. Like the person you did a nice thing for is going to tell another nice person. And then when that person is involved in your life, it's going to, you know, help you. In a way you weren't even expecting, you know, or so think about it in terms of like that, where it's not like an exact one for one type of a trade, you know, it's just, you know, if you're drinking or doing a certain thing, it's probably going to end up being on the negative aspect. For me, it was, and you're going to get things in return that aren't in the direction you want to be going. So finally got the loop straightened out. It's kind of crazy. I got into the whole thing because I hurt my knee. I was just skating every day, still filming. I think I was like 20, 22, maybe 22. And nonstop filming skateboarding. And I was just in Brooklyn, went out filming with my friend Joe Face. And I'm trying to... I think I was going to try to ollie over this bank into a, over a rail into a skinny bank where it was like kink, double bank. And it was like brick, really awkward. So I just go to ride down it just to get used to it. And that first try I ride down it, I get wheel bite, flip forward in this awkward direction. And then there was a pole that was about to knock my teeth out. And so I put my arm up instead of like bracing it or rolling. 
Like I couldn't battle roll, so there was no way out of this fall, and it just put me in this weird position, and it jammed my knee into the ground when I avoided my face from being destroyed. And yeah, that I just messed me up. I couldn't skate the rest of the day. Went home and iced it. Like I had a nice little chunk taken out of my knee. Really swollen after that. Like I got a huge, huge, like I'm talking like down to like halfway down my calf, like sw- halfway down my shin swollen. So iced it up every day, two weeks. Swelling finally went down and I was like, okay, I'm good. I've had these contusions on my knee before. I'll be good to skate. And I go to do my first kickflip. And I remember I flicked it, caught it with my back foot, and my front leg, which is the leg I hurt, I grabbed it in midair and just started screaming, landed on my board, slipped out, and then just helped my knee. I was like, all right, thing is not better at all. So as I was... Yeah, then I went to the doctor, and they told me, what'd they say? I'm trying to put this all together. It was a little while ago. Oh, they told me it was um, torn ACL and PCL, and I needed to get a surgery, but I had just had gotten insurance. What was it? I forgot how the order of the, the events were, but they told me that This injury was pre-existing to me having medical insurance. So maybe I got, I went to the doctor, told him about it, and then I got insurance and I decided to get the surgery and they told me I couldn't get it for a year. Like I had to have insurance for a year and then I could get the surgery. So uh, I got, you know, I had to wait a year. So I ended up just skating on it for a year straight. I wasn't like not going to skate. So I was still right before my surgery. I was jumping down like 10 stairs still like trying to nolly 360 at 10 stair with a torn ACL and PCL really it only hurt when I tried to flick, I guess something with the ligaments or where it was. So I was like still pushing it. I just couldn't do any regular flip tricks. I could still flip switch and jump down things. Then finally got the surgery And that just, like, put me in bed. I think it was three months just laying in bed. And you start taking painkillers, right? And that's another dark thing, like, people don't talk about. Like, that's when I learned how people get hooked on things. Just, like, you get a surgery like anyone else will get. Then you're on painkillers. Then you're addicted to drugs. Like, what? (laughs) it's crazy how that happens. Like, they got to, I don't know. Let people know the severity of it. I mean, I've seen many people get stuck on them. I was almost stuck on them. Um, You know, maybe you should just have to deal with the pain a little bit or just go on something a little lighter, but... Or like a planned weaning off of the pills. But that's another element. You're just sitting in bed doing nothing. Nothing to do. What are you going to do? You're going to take the pills. It's pretty much all your entertainment. So, lying in bed every day, no one comes and visits you, or at least me. You know, you start to see your true friends. You're hanging out with all these people, and everyone's around, and then it's just like when something bad happens, no one comes around, you know? Um, I had a couple of friends pop in, like, once or twice, which is cool. You know, how much do you expect? Like, really, you want someone to, like, come over and, like, be there all the time? It's boring for them too, so it is what it is. Can't hold any grudges, but you're just sitting there alone, left to your devices. Then I started getting better, like being able to walk, getting out of bed. And that's when the drinking comes in, right? Because you're getting messed up from the pills. It's like almost a continuation of that. And you start just talking about skating. Like I was just talking with skaters about skating and what I've done, what I could do, blah, blah, blah. You just, whatever, going out to bars and bullshitting. And 
after a while, that just keeps happening. Just keep going out, going out. You're not skating. And then eventually I got better, right? So then I go out and skate. And, you know, my whole life before this, I never drank or did anything. I was completely straight edge. I barely even hung out with girls. Like, I was obsessed with skating. Then, you know, so I might have just jumped right back into skating and forgot about all this, but I go and skate and I go to the skate park, skating for like 20 minutes, throw my board into the bank, like full speed, like I'm pumping through this drop in and a BMXer just kind of little kid, never at the skate park before, just kind of rides through the skate park, right? And he just comes in and T-bones me as I drop in into a metal hub ledge. It's like a metal ledge. And tears my MCL in the same knee. This is right after I learned how to kickflip again. I was relearning all my flip tricks. I was so psyched. Like a little kid again. You know, ready to just come back like full head of steam. And then just popped, deflated. It's like, I couldn't believe it. I was laying there on the ground, just like staring up at the sky, laughing in disbelief. I'm sure everyone's had a moment like that where you're just kind of laughing in disbelief. Like, how? How is this possible? And then, yeah, that just knocked so much wind out of me after that. Went to the doctor again, and they told me, you know, you tore your MCL. It's only like a slight tear. You don't have to get the surgery. You know, if you're playing football or something, you probably should, but, you know, you should be all right. And it's like, I just got a surgery. So I was just like, whatever. I didn't even get it. And that's it. Then that's when the slowly just drinking, going out with friends and skating less kind of happened, you know? Just that becomes fun. You're trying to meet girls and do that. It's just a different interest in your life at that time. Like you have different interests. You're getting older. And so maybe the element of not making it and skating so far and that egotistical element I was talking about earlier where, you know, it's not cool to, cool to pursue skateboarding like back in that time. So all those things playing a role, you just go out and drink, hang out with skaters, talk about skating. And, yeah, just going, drinking way too much. And then that turns into the problem. That's kind of like where I was at with the alcohol. I ended up being able to give it up and get out of that funk somehow. Like, definitely got lucky. I feel like I'm more back to, like, who I was as a child again, you know? Just didn't need any vices. I've given up caffeine now. Given up what else? Caffeine, alcohol, sugar, um, weed, any drug, anything like that. I'm sure there's more, but yeah, I don't watch TV at all, so I try not to waste any time doing that. Um I mean I'll watch informational videos on YouTube, but that's just about it. Like, I just like progressing and learning. But as for, like, series on Netflix, not my thing. Like, it's very easy to just lose your whole life into a Netflix series. It's like, I get it. You can learn cool lessons and entertainment's cool and all that stuff. And maybe you want to escape the tough day, but... It's like at a certain point, you're just giving your life away. And it's hard. It's hard to pursue what you want to do. It's very awkward and very weird, but I feel escapism is necessary and you almost can't escape it. <laughs> but it's like to that level, that's where shit starts to go awry, you know? You might need to reevaluate. You know, I would watch stuff while I was drinking all the time. Maybe I just link it to that. Who knows? But I feel like I was able to see these things a lot more clearly once I started Xing out alcohol and other things of the nature. 
But, you know, the caffeine thing, that's another interesting thing to talk about because, like, coffee's not necessarily bad. Like, there's been arguments in both directions. No one really knows if it's bad or good or not. Um, you know, they all have their ups and downs. Like, caffeine can help with a lot of things. Could also make you jittery. The list goes on for both the, the negatives and positives. But my overall outlook and why I quit is the same as the alcohol. It's like you're spiking yourself up in the morning or whenever you're having your coffee to later not feel as good, you know? And then that up and down instead of being steady, right? And then it's just kind of like being at a steadiness just overall, right? Not needing to go up and down kind of like you were when you were a kid. Like you didn't need all these things. You didn't need coffee when you were a kid, Like, all this stuff is inside of you. And it's easy to want to take a medicine or, like, watch a show or do whatever it is to hide from these things. But I feel like if you just let them surface naturally, they weed themselves out naturally, you know? And the jitteriness and, like, you know, just being a little less anxious from drinking the coffee... Could benefit people. Uh, The main reason I did it was I linked it with cigarettes, which was another one I think I left off. Quit that. But that's another one. What's it? The, uh, yeah, completely forgot where I was going with that. But the cigarettes, I quit. Oh, I quit the caffeine for money, to be honest. That was like one of the main things because. Well, one, I knew it was an impurity that I just wanted to get rid of and not be dependent on something outside of me. And the second thing is, that was the second thing, starting to lose it. Um, The money. Like, it's just, I'm trying to progress. I'm trying to use YouTube. I'm trying to grow a skate wheel company. And, you know, seven cups a day, 10 cups a day times three to five bucks wherever it is, wherever you are, that adds up every day. So I was just like, all right, take it out. Funnel this time and energy into what I love to do. And it worked. Like the hypothesis ended up working. It made sense. And so I just keep like repeating that throughout my life. Um, But the cigarettes, that was... I still can't believe I quit cigarettes, man. It's I was a chain smoker. Just nonstop cigarettes. People knew me for cigarettes. I would skate with them in my mouth. Like I was a proud smoker. And I still don't have anything really against cigarettes. Like I just love them so much. I love them like romantically. Like, I just love them. It was nice to come home to one with my coffee and just like or be able to take a break at work, or all these things. But it's another thing, cigarette. I'm working, I'm editing, jump up, smoke a cigarette. You start to realize it's an escape, you know? I started to realize I was escaping myself and my duties or the things I even felt I should be doing from, you know, just going to the window, going to the window, I gotta get a coffee, I gotta go to the car. You know, it's always got to go in the car and go to the store and buy some cigarettes like or just have a conversation with someone. There was always like an escape element to it. And even when I'd argue it in my head and try to figure out a reason for me to quit, I couldn't think of any except that I didn't ever want to be owned by anything. And I felt that was the one thing that really owned me was cigarettes, you know? And like a company was owning me. And that wasn't even enough to quit, though. Like, that wasn't the reason I quit. I ended up quitting cigarettes because I went to Seattle on a trip to a Zoomies convention with my cousin Brett Conti. 
he owns um fortune skateboards and him he owns that with manny santiago so all three of us went there for like a zoomies thing that was for the brand and on that trip manny was like why do you smoke so much (laughs) like you smoke an insane amount and I was also talking about my wheel company, showing him my graphics. And he said to me, he said, I will post about your wheel company on my Instagram once a month if you quit smoking. In that moment, it hit me. I was like, do I care more about smoking than like my future, the love of my, like the passion of my life, having a company or like being able to make a living off of skating or helping people like just my whole vision. Do I care more about smoking than that? And that's when it kind of hit me. And then, so I took his deal. And then from that day on, I haven't smoked and it's been, I don't know, nine months, something like that. So shout out to Manny, Manny Santiago, definitely him and Brett. They both, Brett would always say comments to me over the years. Um, There was actually one time like, but anyway, thank you to both of them. Can't thank you guys enough. But there was a time when I just loved watching him progress. Like I gave him his first board, took him out everywhere. I had a car when we were kids and I took him everywhere, street skating with all my friends. Like, I just loved watching him progress, like sharing all my information with him, skating with all like better people and around the city at a young age. So he got to advance early and I just love that. And where was I going? Completely just drew a blank on this. Hold on. (laughs) Oh, so we were going to a fort. A 12 stair, 12 or 11 stair handrail, right? One of the few big ones in Long Island. There's not many. And I just love watching him progress. So I told Brett, if he backside lip slid this 11 stair handrail, which was pretty insane. Like no one in Long Island was doing that really at all. Um, I'll quit smoking, right? Bunch of people there. We're there. He's trying it. He ends up doing it perfectly. Unbelievable. And he ended up doing a few other tricks that day too. But he did the back lip. And I took out, I think it was like 17 cigarettes that were left in the pack. I put them all in my mouth at once and smoked them all. (laughs) Smoked them all. And... After that, on the way home, like 15 minutes later, I bought a pack of cigarettes. So, uh, yeah, it was, that was a younger me. But, you know, so he always wanted me to quit. So I appreciate, you know, him always saying that. And he's just a good dude, always pushed in the right direction as well, like trying to do just good, positive things in his life. So. I don't know if I just didn't do those positive things because of the rut I got stuck in from drinking or or if I linked it with that ego stuff and it just seemed too pompous to do something good, if that even makes sense. But um, who knows? Like, that's what I was at my core. And that's really what always has made me happiest is just helping people. Because even when I was drinking, like, I would just... I would work for free. I would go help people move for free. You know, I'd just do all sorts of things for free, give away all my stuff. So, yeah, it was just probably because I was just distracted. You know, I wasn't focused. But, yeah. There's, There's definitely an element of giving up things. You know, like sacrificing. That just really helps in life. It's like a, almost a magnetic type of a thing. I think about it. Like, it's like things to me tend to work in opposites, you know? So if you want something so, so badly, a lot of the times, and you're like, 
picture that nice guy finished last type of thing. This isn't a great example, but you're like overly nice trying to get the girl and then they don't like you, right? It's like that opposing pull. It's like opposites. So probably a terrible example, but I think you get the idea. So picture that, but if you're doing, let's see. All right, just completely spaced out on this one. Um, oh, so you give up something. That's it. You give up something, and you think that's going to be the end of the thing you love. So if you love watching TV, right, because you love uh, being entertained, you love having fun, and you think, if I give up TV, I'm going to not have fun anymore. But by giving things up, and having that, like, I don't know, you just give it up, you let go of your attachment, and then the opposite starts to happen, right? Your life becomes fuller and more entertaining and more fun because you start learning about yourself or the thing you were, like, hiding. So things, to me, tend to work in opposites. Like, you know, you give up something and it works the opposite way or almost the thing you really craved was at the other end, you know, so... Interesting thing to think about. Um, but when I first started to talk about this podcast, I asked you guys a bunch of questions um, to ask me questions on my Instagram. So I'm going to take a couple of questions from Instagram now. Let's see what we got. We got, for, we got a question from Martin B. Geld, who asked if uh, there's a possibility of a European tour. So for those of you guys who don't know, I did a challenge on my channel where I learned a new trick in every state in America for 50 days in a row. So he's asking if I'm going to do that in um, Europe. It's a possibility. I was thinking it might be a little like dried out and cheesy after that point. Like it would just get a little like boring. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. You think that could be cool to do in another country? Will it get boring? Maybe I'll label it as something different, you know, instead of seeing that same title over and over 50 videos, but I've been kicking it around, maybe an Australia version or UK. A lot of the guys from a UK forum would always uh, like support the challenges I do and stuff like that. So I've heard it's easy to get around there and it would be possible. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Um, Felix Constantine asked, what was my job before the tour started or before uh, the 50 States Challenge? I was a server. So I talked about this, I think, during the challenge, but in case you missed it, I, in this process of like quitting drinking when I was re like building my whole life, I made the choice to start serving. And my theory was, I'll get to talk to people more. Like I can network, which I know was never really a networker. I still don't really, but it just kind of happens by default. Um, but I'll learn to talk to people better, right? Because I'll have to be publicly like just talking to people constantly. So that would help me with the YouTube and moving forward in that direction. So I decided to become a server. And it was very awkward and painful, just like everything else. Uh, no one wanted to hire me because I didn't have experience. And I ended up just doing like wrapping to-go food and wrapping up the food and stuff for a taco place. It's like a skater-owned taco restaurant. And yeah, worked there, did that, grinded it out like at 31 years old or 30 painfully until I eventually could become a server. And now I'm pretty good at it. You know, I can get through and I could probably do it in any country if I wanted to move there and just pack up and move anywhere. And I also thought about it in terms of that I would be able to, um, I would be able to, what's it? Oh, like still do my YouTube video so I could serve at night and still skate and film during the day and stuff like that. So definitely did that on purpose, and I've been enjoying it. It's been a good learning experience. 
All right, next up we got. Hmm. We got Lima Beans. Lima Beans asked, How do I psych myself up before a scary trick? It's a good question. Um, a lot of the times it's from like friends being there and like hyping each other up or something like that. You know, it's really like you feel the energy differently, or I do when there's people around. But, you know, on this trip, I had to do it by myself. So, a lot of the times I would just, I would have an idea. And I think what really pulls me to want to do these tricks is that if they haven't been done before, you know, it gives me like this motivation to want to do it, right? So that's like the initial thing. Then after that, if I know I can do it, I'm just excited to push my limits and I'll know it's there. I'll know it's there. And then I'll just kind of rip it off like a bandaid, right? Because once you get over that first try, you'll know if you could do it or not. And you usually can. Like, it feels like a lot less. Like, a weight's lifted off. And you're like, oh, that wasn't this crazy. All right, I just put my foot on the, the coping and I got through it. You know, it wasn't that crazy. So, um, that's it. I would say just, yeah, you got to sometimes rip it off like a Band-Aid. Don't do anything outside of your limits. You know, and you should know that. Like, you're, you're teetering on that limit, right? But maybe in the beginning, don't try to push it too far. Because that's how you get hurt. But that's kind of my mindset when I go about it. All right. And we got, I think this will be the last question. We'll do Lucas. Lucas asked, if I don't watch skateboarders, how do I compare myself to what's out there? So I said this in one of my videos that I don't really watch skating. and I mean, by default, I'm going to see skateboarding on Instagram or YouTube. Like, I'm doing it. I'm going to see it. I just try not to watch it like ever because one, I don't like to be influenced so much by like someone else's skating or ideas because then you start to really like you can adapt them pretty easily. That's like what we do is like human nature. So I try not to really like intake anything and just try to keep my own ideas operating like in my own head. And then what else? Um, before I started, before I quit skating, I was like obsessed with it and always watching like the barracks and like, you're just constantly watching skate videos. I don't know. It's like two different mindsets. And then once I quit skating, I left it and came back. I was like free from the whole thing, like all the ideas and what people thought and cared about. I was just like an older guy. I just didn't care. I just wanted to have fun and like relax and skate and do my own thing. And like all those ideas and talk didn't matter anymore, you know? So yeah, obviously it helps for progression to see what's going on, but you know, you can get too absorbed in it and it can hold you back. So I don't know just where I'm at right now, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up this first episode. If you guys made it through, I'm psyched. I'm psyched for this whole thing. Psyched to see where it goes, like where it goes down the road, how much I learn about myself, where the format goes. Like who, who knows? I don't know. I'm sure I'll have guests in the future. So I'm psyched. I'm doing this whole thing on my iPhone. So I don't even know if it's recording right now. I could have been here talking for over an hour to no one, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys next week. I think I'm going to do them every week. So see you guys next week.